Hello, everyone. Welcome to this week's Product School webinar. Thanks for joining us today. Just in case you didn't know, Product School offers product management certificates online and at over 20 campuses worldwide. On top of that, every week we offer some amazing local product management events and host online webinars, live streams, and Ask Me Anything sessions. Head over to productschool.com after this webinar to check them out. Hi, Product School. I'm Alex Crumpler, and I'm here today to talk to you about how to build discovery habits. Quickly about who I am. I started uh, my professional career at Post Properties, learning how to speak to customers. Then went on to How Stuff Works to learn how to build digital products. And went to ShareCare, which was a health and wellness uh, technology startup, and learned product management there, or started to learn product management there. And then now I'm currently at CNN Digital, uh, continuing to grow as a product leader. Let's dig into product discovery. So what is product discovery? Uh, product discovery is definitely not a sequential or linear path. Uh, this quote from Ed Catmull sums it up best. Discovery by, by definition means you don't know the answer when you start. Uh, that is so true. Uh, there's usually assumptions or an opportunity um, or a little bit of information or a little glimpse of an idea, but you really don't know where it's gonna go or what it actually means. You first have to do a lot, a lot of research uh, and a lot of different things uh, to really start to understand uh, what value uh, or what problem you're trying to solve. So at this point, you know, in your discovery process, you know, you're really in uh, in research mode, right? So a product manager uh, is, is starting to understand what the opportunity is, understand its customers' pain points, understand it's uh, the gain that uh, this product or this idea might have for its customers. Uh, right now, you are just in a deep research mode, understanding, uh, understanding your customers, and you're talking to them a lot to really, really get at uh, what their opportunity um, is or what the problem is that you're trying to solve for them. So you're doing that in kind of some high level ways. You're interviewing them, you're observing their behavior, and you're just analyzing incoming data if your product is already out there. And so that discovery process uh, has, you know, a, a little bit of a cadence, I guess you could call it, right? You know, uh, you want to be doing it all the time, right? It, it is continuous. It is, it is weekly. You don't just stop and start it. Um, it should be a part of your daily routine as a product manager, talking to customers, reviewing data, um, and getting to understand, uh, again, their problems or opportunities um, uh, in the space that you're, that you're focused in. Um, and so you can do that through weekly customer interviews to help build that empathy. Um, with them to deeply understand um, who they are, uh, again, what their uh, what the problems they're having um, in, you know, let's say a news consumption space, um, and what uh, uh, what you want to do uh, to help uncover if there's an opportunity for you to alleviate that pain or to alleviate that problem that they are having in in finding news or something like that. That's just an example. Um, you can watch user behavior. Um, See how people are ebbing and flowing through their day. That's product discovery. Are people um, at a coffee shop and are they on their mobile device or are they on their desktops? You know, do they stop in a hallway to watch the TV and then check their phone to look at something? Um, that can be very, uh, very helpful in how you're understanding customer behavior. You, know, you can survey people. You know, if you don't want to talk to people and don't want to watch people, um, you still need to do that. But let's say for some reason you couldn't do that, uh, a good place to start right, um, that might reduce the anxiety of product discovery um, is survey people. Build a simple survey, ask them some questions, don't ask leading questions, and, and get that out there um, to start to kind of see if, 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 if your idea or if the opportunity that you're looking at or the space you're looking in resonates with people. Why or why not? And just keep asking those questions. Um, analyze data. So your customers are going to give you a wealth of data. So let's say you have a product that's already out there in the space uh, and you're looking to do, you know, another uh, iteration of it, right? Use that data that you're capturing already uh, to help inform uh, areas of opportunity. And then rapid prototyping, right? So as you're getting this information from your 
uh, from your customers and from the data, you want to take that and you want to think of just really lightweight and simple and fast um, prototypes that you can start putting in front of people. They can be paper prototypes. They can be screenshots. Um, they can be a little bit more complex and put them as working prototypes, clickable prototypes like an Envision, but really try to get rapid prototypes up and running so you can you, you can kind of visualize your idea um, or visualize some some things that might help solve uh, the pain points that your customers might have told you. So I get asked a lot too of hey what what types of tools and then or, or what what sets of tools which ones are the right ones which ones are the wrong ones when do I use you know this tool versus that tool and the answer is really none of that. Like, again, it's not sequential. It's not um, it's not a linear process. Again, it's more art than science. And, you know, you, you don't do surveying before, you know, talking to people um, or talking to people before surveying. Uh, they can happen uh, in parallel with each other. And that's uh, what I'm finding is is pretty successful. Uh, so here's an example paradigm. Um, so you start to begin understanding your customers' pains and gains or you under, you, you're, you're pointed at an opportunity. Um, I start by surveying people. Um, it's just a natural way I gravitate towards, um, especially if I just have a little bit of an idea or a whim of an idea in my head. Um, I'll get that out there to start to get information quickly uh, to see if that uh, has some good energy around it. In parallel, right, I don't wait till that survey is done. I go in, uh, to my local coffee shop and I start talking to people. Uh, I start to kind of understand uh, if this idea is resonating with them, why or why not. And then if that uh, continues on a positive trajectory, uh, I will go a little bit bigger and broader and go leverage my networks. So one that uh, that I found to be successful is that I have an MBA from Georgia Tech. And so I've got a really passionate uh, alumni network at Georgia Tech um, at the Shiller School of Business. And I will ping that group on on LinkedIn and start to get their feedback. It's a couple hundred people. Um, so it's a really great way to start to kind of grow um, that data set around that idea and really get some good information on whether um, it, it has uh, it, it has a positive trend to it or a negative trend and to iterate from there. And then like previously said, if your product is already out there uh, in the market and you have a V1 and you're looking to iterate on it and expand on it, look at the data that you're collecting. Leverage your data scientists or leverage your research specialists. Um, dig into that data and see where there's opportunities to uh, to make improvements or um, uh, stop, uh, you, you, you know, s understand a, a point where people are stopping and understanding why they're stopping and see if you can alleviate uh, alleviate that problem. So, again, kind of circling back on that is. Start serving people in, in parallel, start talking to people, a lot of people, leverage your networks and seek out data to help inform your process. So after you've kind of got a sense, right, let's say that your idea um, has some positive energy around it. Um, that's some good kind of qualitative data, right? So now, now it's time to think about how you can get some quantitative data. And one really fast, quick way to do that is through fake door testing. And that is uh, a lean method to quickly validate if customers are interested in your product or feature with minimal effort. A perfect example of this is uh, the, the, the commerce sites like, um, like Indiegogo, right? Folks are putting stuff up there. Those products are not built yet. Most people think that, um, uh, you know, there's there, there's maybe a prototype, a rough prototype, but now they're they're putting it out there to see if if they're going to get um, uh, get the demand that they want. It it's very similar. Um, it's maybe not as uh, um, uh, not as high fi as as an Indiegogo campaign, um, but this is one quick way uh, that you can understand uh, demand um, of your of your product or your idea. And so here's a um, here's a quick example. Um, this is a, a product here at CNN Digital, and we want to understand um, if people would be interested in following uh, a story. So you can see uh, this little red button right here um, that says follow story. That's a demand test. All that will do is, um, you know, you, you click it, and it'll give you some feedback of saying, you know, we appreciate your interest in this. Um, uh, we'll let you know when this, is, uh, when, this, when this is ready. 
and we'll understand, you know, to percent of audience, if we get a, a high, you know, click rate, that maybe this is something that that we should do, and then look at expanding it from there to a beta panel or opening it up um, and understanding then what uh, you know what types of alerts they would like to receive, how they want to receive them, and so forth. So uh, taking it from a really, you know, abstract or high level uh, concept, and then putting in a little quantitative data test like a fake door test is an easy and scrappy way to um, to continue to gather data about your idea and and learn if you should iterate, um, continue down a path, the path you're on, or make a decision to, to stop. Um, so when you're gathering information in your product discovery process, um, just at a high level, like data just gives you a hint where to look at. It's really important to understand the why, because the why you'll learn from talking with your customers. Both are important, but really getting outside of your office walls, the space that you're in, and going out into the market or going out into your community and talking to people is where you're going to learn the most. Data is very important. Like if you've got a product out there, version one of it, and, you're trying, and you can dig in and see what that data is telling you, great. That is, that's very helpful to the process, but it really, really can't stress it enough. Get outside your walls and talk to people and you'll learn so, so much from them. So kind of recapping is product discovery again, it's messy. <laughs> it is. It is not sequential. It is not linear. Um, it. It is. It, it is this and that. It is surveying. It is talking to people. It is digging into data. It's rapid prototyping. Um, it's all of that in parallel with one another. Um, so, when you approach product discovery, just know that there's. You know, you have those tools I've mentioned, and I'll go over a few others in a little bit. Um, Pick which ones you're comfortable with or familiar with and just start. That's the most important thing. If you're comfortable with talking to people first, start there. If you're comfortable with sending a survey to kind of get a pulse on things, start there. There's the important part is to start and to talk to people outside of your normal day in and day out. You know, can't stress it enough either. Don't make big, robust prototypes. So here's another example um, of some of that fake door test. Uh, start simple. You know, this one shows a, uh, are you interested in these types of news? I mean, you can see that it has no branding. It has no um, real design to it. You can see the buttons. I mean, they're very rudimentary. Um, and, you know, we're not using a lot of, you know, high powered things to, you know, to power this. This is simply a prototype to shop around in your customer interviews um, to get people to play with it, understand their expectations, what they would want next. So this is just an example of a simple prototype that you can see uh, that is clickable. Um, I don't think it's clickable in this presentation, but it is um, that you can send out, send out to your network, send out to, you know, <laughs> your mom, your family, whomever, just to start to get feedback with. Um, just start simple. Um, you know, this is a good point too, right? Uh, I, I always get questions as well about, well, there's product discovery, but there's also the delivery of that thing, right? Uh, yes, uh, that's a great question and they're very different. Um, this lays this, uh, this graphic lays it out really clearly. Um, and I can't take credit for this one. This one's from the SVPG group. This is the Silicon Valley product group, a uh, wonderful group. Uh, they have a ton of resources, highly recommend um, checking them out. Um, but you can see, right, you start with an objective or you start with an idea and the discovery process, you know, is those four kind of key bullet points over there. You're trying to understand the value, if your thing is usable, if it even is a tech technically feasible by talking to your engineers, um, and if it's viable, right? Is this something that would be good for your business? Um, and you can see, like, start small, right? It's there. The graphic shows starting with a skateboard, right? The the consumer probably wants a car, but you don't know that yet. 
right? Um, you don't know the answers yet. You have to ask and you have to talk and you have to gather data to get to that point. Um, and so by building a skateboard, uh, you, you show that in front of them and look, they're not happy because <laughs> that's not what they want. You add a handle, you add some pedals, and then you add a motor and then you add, you know, a chassis and a, a beautiful, you know, car body and then boom, there you go. Then um, if you've got something that's happy, uh, happy customers and they're using it, um, they're using it frequently and you're getting that feedback and you're perfecting it, um, then you can think about moving it into that delivery um, part um, of product development. And uh, this is where you're going to scale that product. You're going to make it reliable and super performant um, and make it one of those products that you can maintain. Um, so this is, again, uh, from the SVPG group. That's the Silicon Valley product group. Um, this is a really wonderful um, takeaway from this presentation is to, to understand this graphic, dig into it, um, practice it, um, and understand the difference between discovery is finding out what your customers want um, through that value, usable, feasible, viable um, framing. And then once you got that, um, which can be fast, can be long, um, just depends. Uh, then it goes into that delivery kind of mode where you're going to scale that product, make it reliable, perform it, um, and maintain it. Okay, so we talked about what product discovery is. Um, and actually, before diving into this next section, real quickly, if you don't do product discovery, which I think is um, is important to bring up, um, it, it's you're you're not going to have a fun time as a product manager um, because if you're making assumptions and assuming that's what your um, uh, what your customers want, uh, you could be absolutely wrong, and you're going to waste a lot of expensive engineering time, your company's time, um, and build something that uh, your consumers don't want and won't use. So. Um, that's the other side of it. So product discovery, yes, is messy. Um, it's fun because you get to learn uh, about your customers, but if you don't do it, trust me, um, you might get something to market faster. Um, but you're highly, highly likely not to succeed because you haven't been listening, uh, to what your customers want or solving their problems, um, as elegantly, um, as you possibly can. So building discovery habits. So when I started my discovery journey um, as a product manager, uh, what worked for me is that I, I really, it sounds so simple and so silly, but I really just marked off time on my calendar. That's how I started. I said, um, Monday mornings here at my company are, are a little bit lighter. So I said in the mornings on Monday, I'm gonna devote some time to go grab a coffee at my local spot um, and uh, and start talking to people. And I do that. Monday, Monday mornings, Wednesday mornings, and, um, and Friday afternoons. Um, find what works best with you, but highly recommend that you, you know, put some time on your calendar to keep you honest and remind yourself um, so it doesn't get scheduled over that as a product manager, that's where you should be spending most of your time and you need to be out there um, talking to your customers. So I found it very effective. Again, I know it's kind of just, you know, uh, wow, that's so easy, but sometimes it can be hard to do product managers, right? We're, we're super busy and um, we're in high demand. And so we have to go to these meetings and keep a pulse on our, our delivery team um, and be talking to customers. And so those, those other things can easily get scheduled over um, our discovery time. So make sure that you're using your calendar um, and, uh, and blocking that off and be transparent with your team. You know, this is where I am for this morning. I'm out doing product discovery that's going to help us um, build um, amazing products or inform the things that we're working on. Um, your team will absolutely, uh, you know, protect you and champion that of you. Um, I have no doubt. So just be transparent with them and tell them what you're doing. Um, and if you're, you know, a product manager and you have an associate product manager or product owner um, or your product designer and your um, uh, lead engineer or tech manager, bring them along that journey with you. Invite them to come to that coffee shop so you guys can divide and conquer and get in front of uh, more people and then synthesize that data together um, and then come back in, into the office. Um, so really use that. And then, uh, that local coffee shop I mentioned, um, it, it find a familiar place, uh, you know, for some product discovery can be this kind of a little bit of an anxiety and, you know, have some fear in it. It doesn't have to be. Um, so find a familiar place, wherever that is. Uh, mine happens to be, you know, a local coffee shop here in Atlanta where I live 
And, um, and I've built some relationships there over the years. And again, it's got this um, very accepting and open and talkative, um, you know, kind of community around it. And so they're really open to um, to looking at things and um, and giving me feedback. So it's this, you know, safe space. So find a safe, familiar space um, to start your product discovery um, habit building. All right. So those tools. Um, there's a wealth of tools out there, right? So there's tools to start your discovery process um, with like surveying and talking to people um, and recording that, right? Uh, and how you synthesize all that data is, is very helpful and how you capture all that data is very helpful. So one way uh, that that happens um, is, is through a multitude of means, right? I've used all of these. So I currently use Keynote um, to build rapid prototypes. Um, that way, you know, I don't uh, um, have to ask my product designer to be building, you know, prototypes and envision or something like that. I can do that really quickly to get to get an idea out of my head and across in some type of like uh, tangible way. Um, and while he's kind of working on more robust prototypes for things that we've, you know, validated that we want to put into some more robust, um, rigorous kind of testing. Um, I've used this collaboration software over here or mind mapping collaborative um, software called mind map. Um, that's really good. If you're talking to just a ton of people, you can start to put it um, into themes and get some bubbles and, uh, um, and understand kind of uh, where things are mapping to. So check that one out. It, it's fun. Um, it's really cool to see kind of clusters of information as they start to form. Um, but that's a good one too. Um, Airtable. Just started recently using Airtable. I'm in my product uh, toolkit and I love it. It's super easy um, to use, very nimble, tagging, filters, searchable. Um, love it. It's great on your desktop. It's great in your pocket on your phone. Uh, really, really enjoy that one. And then also um, here at CNN, uh, uh, we use Full Story or have used Full Story in the past. Um, I use it to review user sessions, uh, really, really good to kind of understand, um, you know, what people are doing as opposed to just what they're saying. Um, so if you have access to some type of, uh, you know, user session kind of behavioral kind of software, definitely consider using that in your discovery toolkit. Very helpful to understand kind of where people are having a good time in your product and where people are having a bad time in your product. Um, Kind of going back to just showing how simple it is in Keynote to articulate something. Um, so this just shows, hey, we think that we should have a better video experience um, in one of our products based off of um, some uh, trends and data that we were seeing. And so in Keynote, uh, quickly um, uh, whipped up this prototype to start to show to people. And all it is is, you know, you tap. Uh, you tap the play button and this dedicated video experience slides out. Um, that was it. That literally is the prototype. And so I literally started to show people at that at not my local coffee shop, but at a Starbucks. Um, I showed them that and one or two other um, examples. And that one was the most uh, that was that was the one that they said voted that was the most intuitive. And so that was super helpful just to have that. That literally took me five or 10 minutes to do in Keynote. And I had a prototype. Um, to go and show people based off of some earlier conversations at that same coffee shop of um, their video kind of experience, behaviors, expectations of what happens when they tap a video on a on a mobile web page. And so that's how quickly it went. It went from, you know, 30 minutes of conversations to me taking a 10 to 15 minute break uh, and working up a prototype or two in Keynote, showing the two different prototypes um, to those same people and some more people getting that sense of, um, uh, of data feedback. And then uh, our team uses Slack. Uh, and so I was kind of in a near real time sending them that information, uh, letting them know kind of the pulse of what was happening with, you know, our video discovery process that we were um, currently working on. So you can see how you can get pretty, um, pretty scrappy with, you know, just talking to people, connecting it to like a keynote type of software, rapid prototyping software, then go showing those people um, based off the feedback they gave you and just iterating there forward. And you can get to a pretty, um, pretty solid, pretty solid answer um, really quickly. Um, 
kind of going back to the tools that uh, the the tools that I use and that you know I've, I've, uh, some of my product peers and colleagues use, um, it's very important to to synthesize all this data, right? That that is a big question out there: is how do you synthesize all this? We've got I'm talking to people, I'm writing it in notebooks. I've got data and you know data dashboards like Omniture. I've got um, prototypes. Uh, I've got survey results, and it's hard. Um, because all that data can mean different things and to really, really uh, bring that together um, can be difficult. So I say leverage your research partners, leverage your your, your team um, to help you kind of understand the data and the themes that um, uh, that are bubbling up. A really good way is, is kind of visual synthesis, right? Um, you know, it's one thing, uh, again, of what people say. I think that's really important, like through surveying. Um, I, I really think that if you have a, a, a user session capturing software like a full story, seeing what people actually do um, or doing a demand test, a fake door test to understand what they are doing with your product. Um, it kind of puts a visual um, representation um, to the opportunity or uh, the problem you're trying to solve. Um, you can just get uh, we're very visual creatures. So having some type of visual synthesis or visual representation of what uh, the data is telling you um, is very important. So like uh, going back to, to that MindMeister um, collaborative mind mapping software, right? As you're interviewing people, you can be putting, you know, themes into bubbles and, and so forth. And when you're reviewing that, you can, you know, kind of put those similar themes or the, the same things that keep being repeated over and over again um, into clusters. And that's a wonderful visual tool that you can show your team or your leadership um, or other product or delivery teams in your um, in your company that um, you can say, like, hey, I talked to these 100 people and you can see that they all wanted X, Y and Z. And here are some other like clusters of themes of information that bubbled up that are pretty interesting that we want to explore. So um, just having spreadsheets with numbers um, is fine. But I think if you really want to articulate um, what you're getting from your your product discovery uh, research process, really look at opportunities and softwares and tools to visualize um, visualize that data. You just help to get your um, uh, get your points across, uh, get your opportunities across uh, across and 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 where you should kind of point your ship. So getting close to the end, so thanks for staying with me. Um, another great quote quote by a uh, wonderful product leader, um, Teresa Torres, is discovery is messy, it's not linear, um, good discovery is continuous, the day we stop being curious about our customers is the day our competitors start catching up. Um, I love this quote, uh, it really hits on a lot of key themes that, you know, again, not a linear process, you just have to start somewhere, um, start to gather information by talking to customers, sending out surveys, putting prototypes in front of people and gathering that data. Um, through a lot of different ways, through what people are saying and what people are also doing. Um, yes, can't harp on it enough that good discovery is continuous. You don't just do it for a week and then stop. It is a part of your process. It is a part of your day. It is a part of your week. As a product manager, it's just, it's, it's 80 20 almost, right? To keep it simple, 80% of your time should be just in discovery mode, learning and constantly reviewing um, consumer feedback types of data to again, um, understand pain points and look for new areas, opportunity of where you want to take your product or products um, and keep going, right? Uh, good product managers are empathetic and they're also very curious, right? Uh, you always want to be looking for new and novel ways of remixing products or features um, or leveraging new technologies that have come out to see if that will meet a need um, for your customers um, and your business. So kind of finalizing up here, um, I think the big three key takeaways uh, for product discovery, um, product school community is just one, lots of talking, lots of trying. Talk to as many people as you can, often and frequent, um, lots of trying. Put a lot of different prototypes, lo-fi prototypes in front of people um, and through user testing, um, A-B testing, fake door testing, demand testing to really get a sense of, again, what people are saying and what people are doing and synthesize that data. Um, the real simple one, right, that seems silly again is use your calendar to mark off that time if you're just starting on your product discovery journey. Um, you know, 
take time out of your day each day to say this, these are the days or this is the time that I'm going to be doing product discovery. It's very important um, for your product growth and as well as for um, your product's growth um, and be transparent with your team. Tell them that that's what you're doing and you'll keep them uh, as a co-pilot um, right in that rocket ship. Uh, so they know uh, what you're working on and, um, and and bring them along on that journey. They will probably be more than uh, likely and would want to be on that journey to understand the customers as well, especially include your lead product designer and your lead uh, tech, meet, tech lead um, or tech manager. And then use simple tools to synthesize your research, right? So uh, there's a lot out there. Uh, I found that uh, that mind mapping, MindMeister is really good. Um, Airtable is another way to, uh, you know, do some visual representations of, of your data and also a great data capturing tool. So just make some good columns as you're capturing user feedback. Um, it's good, you know, for tagging and filtering. Um, and then you can make some some interesting kind of uh, graphical representations out of it. Um, and then uh, so that wraps it up for, you know, the product discovery um, part of this. Uh, you know, I always get questions too of kind of like what literature, what books, you know, things should I be reading? Um, I hinted on, uh, it before, but take a look at SVPG or Silicon Valley product, product group. Um, they have a, a lot of great articles and a wonderful newsletter, um, and an awesome book by Marty Kagan, uh, called Inspired. Um, so look at their, uh, resources. Very, very helpful. Always new stuff coming out. Um, great stuff. Uh, the Four by Scott Galloway, also a really good book. Um, maybe less, not less geared towards like product uh, management, like principles or anything like that, but a really good book about, you know, Facebook, Apple, Amazon, Google, um, you know, how they, you know, control markets, how they entered markets. Um, and um, just, just really insightful, uh, insightful book. Uh, principles by Ray Dalio. Again, uh, not so like focused on, um, you know, like product management principles and anything like that. Um, but really, really good, uh, work life balance, uh, type of, type of principles, you know, product managers days, um, are, are pretty crazy. Um, and, uh, what we do is, um, is still pretty emerging discipline. Um, and Ray Dahl has got some really good principles of, um, uh, that might help kind of point your ship and, you know, point your life. Um, just a very, very, very helpful, um, helpful read. Uh, Radical Focus, uh, this one um, by uh, Christina Watke uh, is great. Um, very thin book, um, which is awesome. <laughs> uh, really quick, quick read, but a, a great one for finding focus, um, you know, through the objective and key result framework. So pick those up. Uh, those have been really helpful reads in my product, business, um, just leadership uh, um, career so far. Um, and I reference them off, uh, often. Um, really, really good. And last but not least, um, we are hiring at CNN Digital. Um, so there's that link uh, below. Um, I'll leave it up for a minute uh, while I talk to it. But we're growing. Um, we're looking for product managers um, uh, uh, of all sorts. So hit that link. Um, see if uh, any of them appeal to you and, um, and, and hope you apply and hope you join our, our growing team. All right. Well, thank you all so very much uh, for uh, being uh, here with me today and, and watching this talk. Uh, I hope it was helpful. Um, if you ever uh, need product advice or uh, want to bounce ideas around, or just connect and, and grow your you know product professional network. Um, I'm happy to connect with you on LinkedIn. Um, again, I'm Alex Crumpler, uh, and I hope you continue on your product journey and wish you all the best.